first of all, welcome. Thank you so thank you. much for doing this. I oh, really thank you for having me. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a real honor. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. If someone landed from Mars and <laughs> they didn't know what Shopify was, how would you explain it to them? I think the best way to explain Shopify is it really, it just makes it easy to turn an idea into a business. It is this tool, this piece of software that, I mean, we, we, we hope that it makes it a magical experience, but fundamentally, if you want to sell something to somebody else anywhere around the world on any surface area, you can do so with Shopify. And one of the things that I think gets missed about it, uh, because we, we, you know, we, we're trying to become the entrepreneurship company, if, is that if you, if you sort of pretend for a second that Shopify was uh, a single retailer and you were to aggregate all our stores, we'd be the second largest online retailer in America after Amazon. And the, the reason I say that is because the cool part about doing that is when you sign up for Shopify today, the payment rates and the shipping rates and the functionality and the technology that you get, these are, these are things that unfortunately were out of, out of the hands of small businesses pretty much until you know, a couple of years ago. And so now starting a business it's, it's a lot easier. You're able to scale it a lot better and it sort of reduces the barrier to success. Um, but you still have an independent business where they're your customers and you're not renting them from some big marketplace. So um, I, I think Shopify is a sort of entrepreneurial magic wand. Shopify really provides the infrastructure for a small business and kind of soup to nuts. Let's say I decide I want to sell Katie sweaters. You know, so many people have uh, these ideas in the showers in the, in the morning, they're just, yeah. they're like, you know what, I, I would well, love to do. That's and, 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 and by the way, a, a lot, a lot of great. Yeah, exactly. A lot of great ideas come in the shower in the morning, but most people, when they think about those things, the, the, the second thought after they have the idea is, well, it's too complicated or it's too expensive, or I'm not an entrepreneur. I don't really know how to do this. And we, we actually think that those shower ideas, those, when you're an aspirational entrepreneur, those are often some of the best ideas. When you look across some of Shopify's biggest stores, they started as ideas in the shower. And so the next step you would do is you would just go to shopify.com. And for $29, uh, we would walk you through the entire process of building a business. And if you know how to use email, you can effectively build a store on Shopify within you know, an hour or two. And that we think is not only incredibly democratizing, but is incredibly fun as well. One of the coolest parts about being an entrepreneur now in sort of modern times is not only is the cost of failure as close to zero as, as it's ever been, not only is it as easy as it's ever been and, and inexpensive, but also there's a term called DTC, direct to consumer. And it's, it's sort of a business model whereby you as the brand can connect directly with the, the, end, the end consumer. I don't think that's a fad. I actually think that's the way, that's where retail is going. And if you think about, you know, 20 or 200 years ago, the baker sold their bread to the end consumer, the cobbler sold their shoes to the end consumer. And, and so I think we're going back in many ways to having this really authentic, interesting relationship between the brand, the entrepreneur and the person buying from them. Tell me a little bit about Shopify's origin story. Mm -hmm. How did it come to be? About 16 years ago, uh, we were trying to sell snowboards on the internet. Um, and we live in Canada. Uh, Toby, our, our founder, had moved to Canada uh, from Germany, met a girl. And it's not, it's not easy for a new immigrant to get a job. Uh, but one of the opportunities as a new immigrant in Canada is you could start a business, even though you, you can't seek employment. And so he's in Canada. He likes to snowboard. And he decides that uh, he wants to sell snowboards on the internet. And back in, in 2004 or so, 2005, the, 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 there were two ways to sell a product on the internet. The first way was to sell on a marketplace. So you go to you know, some large marketplace, eBay, for example, or Etsy or something like that, and you would sell your products on the marketplace. And that was a very inexpensive way to sell a product online. The only problem with that model was you effectively are renting customers from that marketplace. Um, you don't have a direct relationship with the, the person buying your snowboards. And so it's very difficult for you to build your own brand because pretty much every one of those, you know, uh, those snowboard pages kind of look the same. There's no way for you to stand out. So that was one option. The other option was you would pay some very large software company, uh, like an IBM type company, a million dollars or more, and they would help you build your own custom online store. And that's sort of what, you know, the Walmarts of the world did, or some of the big retailers did, they would go and pay some big software company. And so Toby was frustrated that there wasn't a great way to build a beautiful, scalable, easy to use online store to sell the snowboards. And so being a, a computer programmer by trade, he decides to write a piece of software to allow him to sell these, these snowboards.
And around that time, um, and, and so by the snowboard business does well, it's called Snow Devil. It says a lot of snowboards, but people begin to ask him, uh, hey, can I use the software to sell my products? Can I, can I use the software to sell whatever products is, is more meaningful to me, my, my version? Or my, my athletic wear. Whatever. That's right. Yeah. And so he realizes, wait a second, the snowboard business is a good idea, but maybe the software behind the snowboard business that enables more people to participate in entrepreneurship and small business, maybe that's a great idea. And so he stops selling snowboards and starts focusing on the software. And um, I had met him around that time. This is 2005. And I moved to Canada to go to school. I grew up in the US and moved to Canada to go to McGill first. And then I moved to Ottawa, Canada, where I live now to go to law school to, funny enough, not to become a lawyer, but to become a better entrepreneur. And, and I needed to support myself in school. My parents weren't around anymore and, and didn't have any money. And so uh, I became one of the first merchants to use Shopify. And I started selling t-shirts, uh, licensed t-shirts. And I put myself through law school and business school selling t-shirts on Shopify. And after I finished school, I called Toby back uh, in, in uh, 2009. And I said, I think this piece of software is effectively superpowers for anyone that has ambition, that anyone that has an idea. Is Toby still selling snowboards on Shopify? So Toby and I each have our own businesses. Um, yeah. And part of it is we want to... We want to know what it's like to start a business in, in, in 2021. We want to know what it's like to use Shopify. And so Toby has a sock business on Shopify that he never talks about because uh, he's a little more, uh, he, he just doesn't talk about a sock business. But during the pandemic, uh, funny enough, I, I drink, well, I drink coffee in the morning, but I found my, um, my anxiety levels were actually increasing during the pandemic. We moved to a fully remote setup here. So Shopify is now work from anywhere. And as a power extrovert. Um, I, I felt my, my anxiety levels had, had, had escalated. And I felt that drinking coffee in the afternoon was making me, wasn't helping with that. And a really good friend of mine, um, who's a sort of a tea, you know, connoisseur started suggesting some green teas to me. And he started curating the best green tea on the planet, uh, and dropping them off at my house and saying, Hey, try this tea. And, and so at some point I said, you know, I really want to know what it's like to start a business on Shopify in 2021 during the pandemic. And I think we should do tea. And so uh, David and I started this tea company called Firebelly Tea. And it's not a big company by any means, but it's it's this incredible tea. And I get to use the product and understand, have deep empathy for what it's like to to be an entrepreneur on Shopify. And it's it's so we 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 eat our own dog food at Shopify very much so. I'm gonna have to try that tea because I drink too much coffee too. Let's talk about Shopify versus Amazon. There's a great quote by by your CEO uh, Toby. And he's differentiated Shopify from Amazon by saying that, quote, Amazon is trying to build an empire and Shopify is trying to arm the rebels. I love that. But what exactly does he mean? Yeah, well, it's a sort of a, a nod to a sort of a, a you know, a Star Wars metaphor there, uh, of course. But um, we don't want retail. We don't want commerce to be one size fits all. Um, I think the world would be a pretty sad place if we're all walking around wearing the exact same t-shirt or hoodie or, 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 or you know, non-branded baseball cap. I think the world is more exciting uh, when we have lots of brands, lots of entrepreneurs participating in, in the global economy. You mentioned already uh, some success stories, but Tell us about Figs, for example. In the case of Figs, you have these two wonderful entrepreneurs, Trina and Heather. And they have a friend of theirs who is a doctor. Uh, and they're having lunch with this doctor friend of theirs in Los Angeles. And the doctor is wearing these hospital scrubs, these very traditional sort of off green, pale green hospital right. scrubs. And number one, uh, they're not comfortable. Uh, they don't look very good because they're just not fitted properly. And and over over time, as you begin to wash them, which are very important hospital scrubs, they look worse and worse. There are the, the the product gets worse over time. And so Trina and Heather get together and say, why why is this the case? Why do hospital scrubs need to look so so badly? These are you know our our our, our healthcare workers, our frontline workers are doing a very difficult job. They are, I mean, they're some of the most important people in our society, especially in the last couple of years, but, but, but generally they are. Um, is there a way for us to find a better solution to this problem that they need something that is standardized, that is, you know, that's easy to clean, but that also doesn't make them feel like they're wearing, you know, their, their grandfather's sport coat that's eight sizes too, too big. And, and, so that are create, and that are comfortable, right? And that are comfortable. That's right. Which is, is really, really important to them. And so they begin to sort of tinker because um, they're 
entrepreneurs and had this idea on this idea of creating a new way, uh, a new a new type of brand around um, medical scrubs and, and 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 hospital scrubs, and they launched um, Figs in 2015, I believe. They completely rethought a problem. And I think that's what entrepreneurship is. It's you see something and, and you think that, and you are unwavering and accepting the status quo. And you say, I can do this better. And about a year ago, uh, Trina and Heather stood at the podium at the New York Stock Exchange, which uh, for any entrepreneur, and I, I had the chance to do that when we took Shopify public is, is the most amazing opportunity. And they invited a bunch of frontline workers to join them at the New York Stock Exchange. And they took figs public and it's now a multi-billion dollar company. You said earlier before we officially started that the great resignation was bullshit in your words. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> I was going to clean it up and say baloney, but let's call a spade a spade. And, and I'm curious why you say that, you know, a 3.5 million women have left the workplace in the US, for example, um, because of too much pressure at home and doing their job and homeschooling, et cetera, et cetera. You know, who knows if they'll re-enter the workforce when things seem to normalize in this hopefully post-COVID world. But I gather you're thinking that people aren't resigning, they're just reassessing. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just on 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 the sort of women-owned business part. Um, so more than half the businesses on Shopify are women-owned, and and you know we talk about figs, but there's also Partick Foods and Phenomenal. There's so many brands on Shopify. In fact, more women are building businesses in the past few years. I think 49% of people who started a business during 2020 were women. That's up. I think it's up from 27% in prior years. So. I think you're seeing a lot more people try their hand on entrepreneurship. And again, I think you're seeing a lot more women try their hand on entrepreneurship. And, and I speak as, you know, as, as the husband of uh, a psychotherapist who's also an ice cream entrepreneur. My wife, Lindsay, uh, started an ice cream company called Sunday School, in addition to her being a psychotherapist, because there wasn't an ice cream shop in our community. And frankly, she thought there should be. But this great res resignation, I think, has been completely mis misunderstood. I think that people left the workforce because... Yeah, I mean, some of them were disenchanted with office life, but some of them actually recognized that um, they wanted more, that their life's work was important to them, and they have more options now. And I think the more stories we tell and the more, the more examples we give of people sort of reaching for their own version of independence, and then we add on the fact that technology and software and, and the internet has made it easier to start, grow, and scale a business, you have more people leaving. So I don't believe the great resignation is legitimate. I, I think it's, 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 it's the great reset. And I think that people don't want to work at shitty jobs. Um, uh, or, or bad jobs, uh, if, 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 if I'm going to clean this up a little bit. I think people are looking for to spend their time doing things that are deeply meaningful to them. They want to self-actualize. And, you know, I, I, I think I mentioned earlier this idea of someone that not, not everyone that has a hobby should commercialize that hobby. But there are lots of people that spend their time nine to five doing a job they don't love. And then they go home and they go to their kitchen or they go to their garage or they go to their office or they go to their den or whatever. And they tinker and they play and they build. I think more people are saying, what, what if that was my job? Could I do that? And I think 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 500 years ago, you couldn't necessarily make that change because it required a lot of money and a lot of experience. So you think this is a permanent mind, mind shift and that if the, once the pandemic is behind us, do you think this, this fuel that is exciting entrepreneurship all over the world will wane, or do you think this is here to stay? Oh, I think this is here to stay. I think I, I think this. I, I, there's no putting the genie back in the bottle now. I think people now understand that um, that this is this is something they can do with their time. That they can build, no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, no matter you know how much money you have, you can build a real business and and, and you can support yourself. And so I, I think I, I don't think this is going away. In many ways, Harley, this is the golden age of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious what you think is fueling that and how the pandemic seemed to accelerate trends that were already happening. Yeah. So it's, it's fascinating. It's a great, great question. Great topic. Cause I, I think, I think a great deal about this. So I think, you know, a couple of things happened. First of all, I think COVID-19 brought challenges to small businesses. Um, and, and that's, that's fairly obvious, but I think there were two reactions. There were sort of the first reaction was a lot of businesses, not just small, but big business too. Um, it's as if the tidal wave was coming and they, they, they decided to run for the shore and grab their towel and run for the shore. But then you saw, and those were, they just sort of resisted and they, they sort of waited for the, you know, the, the norm to come, the normal to come back. 
Right. Then you saw this other side of, of entrepreneurs. And I think um, I've sort of described them as these, like these resilient entrepreneurs who, you know, they saw the tidal wave and they grabbed their surfboard and they figured out, okay, how do we shift to digital sur- How do we sur- shift to digital commerce? Um, and I think the pandemic gave a rise to this, this new cultural shift and, 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 and many sort of hit pause to find their life's work. Many traditional businesses said, this is the right time for us to digitalize. It was sort of this great catalyst. This resiliency was incredibly inspiring. And I don't think we're going back to a, a pre-pandemic way of doing business. What about the future of, of brick and mortar stores uh, and sort of the in-person shopping experience? If you're a brand whose consumer values in-person experience. And this is where empathy for your consumer matters a great deal. If you know your consumer well and you have deep empathy for them and your consumers like in-store experiences, you should have a physical store. Years ago, when I was a kid, um, my parents took me to FAO Schwartz. And it, it was, I mean, you know, it was, it yeah. was like the movie Big. It was incredible. I mean, it was like a carnival and a circus all, all mixed in one. And I don't think my parents uh, bought anything in that store, but I remember thinking what a great experience that was. And I think what has happened is over time, the, exper- the experiential version of retail has really come back in a big way. Trina and Heather from Figs recently told me that one of the things that they're doing is they're actually helping some of their uh, some of their consumers uh, find jobs, that, and they're actually helping connect hospitals that are looking for healthcare workers with healthcare workers, and rather just selling them you know medical scrubs, they're actually playing matchmaker from an employment perspective. The wow. reason that they're doing it is because they have deep empathy for who their consumer is, and that I think will always win.